to episode 28. Enjoy. My guest today is Michele Lastella. Dr. Lastella is a sleep researcher at the Appleton Institute for Behavioral Science at CQ University Adelaide, South Australia. Coming from an elite sporting background, Dr. Lastella brings experience from both an athlete perspective as well as a researcher. He has worked with several elite sporting organizations examining sleep, recovery, and performance, and has published 28 international research papers. McKelly, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Listen, maybe we can uh, kick things off here by you telling listeners a little bit more about your background and how you got into research. Yeah, um, I did my undergraduate in psychology at the University of South Australia back in, I think it was 2006 or 2005. And at the, towards the end of my undergraduate, there was some research vacation scholarships going on offer and I put an application in and, and kind of fell into a research path that way. I always wanted to be a, a clinical psychologist in hope to work within, within sports. So it kind of changed direction once that research scholarship came about and, and I haven't really looked back since. Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to jumping into talking sleep and chronotypes here today. And of course, you know, the general suggestion for athletes is to get that eight hours of sleep per night. And in a recent paper that you've done, you know, talking about the chronotypes of elite athletes, can you maybe uh, dive into that and perhaps define the different chronotypes to give listeners, uh, to get listeners on the same page? And then we can talk about differences in the general public compared to elite athletes. Yeah, I think um, the first thing about chronotypes is basically our circadian preference. So if you ask somebody whether they prefer waking up in the morning and, and going to bed earlier, then you would find that they're a morning type. So it's um, there's three main types. So we have morning types. So these are the type of people that go to bed earlier, wake up earlier, um, and they really struggle to stay awake past their, their usual bedtime. And on the other end of the scale, we have what we call night owls, and they prefer going to bed later and waking up later. And somewhere in the middle, we have intermediate types, which is about 70% of the general adult population. Um, for athletes, it's, it's really important, well, especially for coaches, to really know what type their athlete is. Uh, it can be really important when we're scheduling recovery sessions or even training sessions, or even as far as when athletes travel interstate or cross internationally, you know, who they're rooming with. You don't really want to put a, what I call a, a chrono mismatch where you have one athlete that's a morning type and the other one's an evening type in the, in the same bedroom because they may disrupt each other either in the morning or at the night. So it's, it's really important to acknowledge the different types of athletes you have within your group. And you mentioned there sort of the general public falling into that intermediate 70%, uh, falling into that category. And of course, sort of evenly split then in the general public, 14% in the, in the morning type, 16% in the evening types. How does that shift when we get into talking about athletes and high-level athletes? Well, I guess athletes are no different to, to, to us general adult population. But when we start to delve into the different types of sports and, and the different types of chronotypes that are involved in different sports – um, it's really interesting because when we start to examine some morning type sports where they require to get up early to train, we tend to see that there are fewer and fewer evening types within morning sports. So um, it's, it's not necessarily surprising, but my question always is, do athletes tend to pursue and excel in sports that match their, their chronotype? So um, we examined a number of different sports, uh, team-based and individual sports. So cycling and triathlon are typically the ones that train in the early morning. And I think from memory, I th there was only there was no evening types within triathletes. And I think there was a 3% of evening types within the cycling groups that we had monitored. When we get to um, team-based sports, you start to see that, that general spread across intermediate evening and morning um, just like the general adult population. So typically it's more the morning sports have more morning types within that sport. Yeah, it was interesting to read, um, you know, you mentioned baseball players and one of the papers there, their chronotypes and how, you know, a, a batter who's more of a morning type will have a higher average in day games versus an evening type having a higher average in night games. Are there other 
uh, parallels in other sports where we're seeing this uh, chronotypes uh, dovetail into performance outcomes? Uh, that was one of the few papers that actually started to look at uh, chronotype and performance and batting averages. And there was one study, I think, was conducted in, in South Africa, which found marathon runners typically that were morning types were performing better than those that were that were evening types. So that's the only other study I can think of in terms of, of performance. Um, the other main the other main thing to consider is is the recovery of the athletes because typically the recovery sessions uh, in, when I'm referring to uh, team sports here are done in the early morning after a, a night match which potentially could disrupt their dis well, it does disrupt their their total sleep time that they're getting and essentially their recovery yeah it's interesting because they uh, recently uh, in, in the baseball spring training here uh, they had shifted a lot of the early morning sessions you know, that typical nine or 10 o'clock session, they'd shifted that later in the, uh, in the midday um, to allow just for that. So that's uh, interesting to see teams adapting to some of this research. And, you know, of course, your research in elite cyclists, you know, sleeping to a schedule, does chronotype play a part? Can you, you know, walk us through that study and, and again, tease out some of those key findings? Yeah, so that particular study was done, I think it was in 2010, and we had a, a 34, if memory serves me correctly, because it was a while ago now. Um, and, yeah, so the the cyclists really were a lot of morning types within that group. So um, there were, I think, 38% were morning types, which is really interesting because they most often train in the morning. and. I always ask the question, is, it, is there a physiological advantage to train in the morning, such as sports like cycling and, and swimming? Because I know here in Australia we have a big swimming culture and, and they typically get them to, to train in the morning, but there's no physiological benefit to train that early in the morning. And I'm talking 5.30, 6 a.m. And what that does is actually truncate the, the amount of sleep the athletes are getting. So... And it's just, it's a, it's it's kind of a legacy left from before the times where we were we had scholarships or um, professional sponsor, sponsorships to participate in sport. So you'd train before you had to go to work, or it's 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 something that's risen as a teenager where you train before you go to school. But once they get to an elite level and a professional contract type level, there is no real need to to train in the early morning, and and that's what they do still and. Like you mentioned, there are a lot of sports and, and teams that are really catching on with adapting their training schedules to suit the recovery of their athletes. And, and that has a flow on effect in terms of performance, their psychological state, and obviously the, the results that they can produce. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting stuff. And like you said, if you're getting up at 435, oftentimes, especially swimmers, rowers, you just you just can't go to bed early enough to uh, to offset that. And so, um, you know, for folks who are choosing these sports, depending on their own chronotype, is it an unconscious self-selection? Are they sort of adapting to the to the training yeah, sessions themselves? Great, or what's the... Yeah, that's, that's one of the questions we always discuss in the, in the lab is whether or not have, are they choosing themselves or, or are we adapting over time? And when I speak to different professors around my lab, they'll give me two or three different answers. So <laughs> it's a really tough question. But there is some adaptation that, that can take place and then you'll get somebody else that will explain that it, it's, it's, it's a, a matter of biology. So I, I personally believe that you can adapt, and if we're an intermediate type, then you know you, you will be able to adapt your kind of circadian preference or your circadian behaviours to suit that particular to suit that particular sport and that training that training schedule. It's interesting, and of course, you know, on that note, you know, how important is a target bedtime or wake time for athletes? Yeah, well, I think that's that's one of the, the most important things is establishing regular bedtime and wake-up time for athletes and not just for athletes but the general population. Um, it basically sends your body into – sends your your brain the message that it's time to wake up or it's, it's bedtime. So that routine is really important and what we see even with athletes but a little bit different. So with the general population, what they'll do is they'll – they'll accumulate that kind of sleep debt 
during the working week. And then on the weekend, they'll compensate for that and we'll have a sleep in on the weekend. And the same thing we've found with some of our studies with athletes is that when they are training, they will accumulate that sleep debt. And then if there's a rest day, you give them a rest opportunity or an increased sleep opportunity, they will actually take that opportunity and and they will they will definitely sleep in on that rest day. So um, it's it's really important that while you need to sleep in, it's also important to establish that regular bedtime. And of course, it's very difficult when you've got various competition schedules that that may vary from week to week, um, depending on obviously what sport um, the athlete participates in. And of course, we always think of you know quantity of sleep when we're thinking of an athlete who doesn't go to bed early enough and they have maybe an early morning session. But how does the chronotype impact the quality of the sleep? Um, I wouldn't say the chronotype necessarily can impact the quality of sleep, but it it can definitely determine what time you start to feel sleepy. So. Um, just in typically we start to secrete melatonin after 10 p.m. at night. So we call anything before 10 p.m. at night, we call that the forbidden zone uh, for sleep. So basically it's very difficult to initiate sleep before 10 p.m. But morning types may be able to actually initiate that sleep um, before in the forbidden zone, so before 10 p.m., whereas evening types might find it extremely difficult to start or try and attempt to go to sleep before 10. So um, you will find differences between morning and evening types in terms of how easily or how difficult they, they, they can fall asleep before 10 p.m. So uh, asking an evening type to go to bed before 10 will be quite a difficult task, and potentially it's not a good idea because they'll be – they might go to bed and do what you say, but then they'll be tossing and turning and then that will that will breed a, a negative negative mindset when they're going to bed. And I've also heard that, is it true that adolescents are more typically the, uh, the evening chronotype? Yeah, so during adolescence, we experience a, a delay, so a phase delay. And that, um, from memory, it's, it's about one to one and a half hours later, so they start to secrete melatonin which is that that main sleep hormone uh, they secrete that uh, approximately an hour and an hour and a half later so typically with teenagers that's why they call them sleepy teens they will typically go to bed a lot later but what will happen is that they'll go to bed a lot later but then they have to get up for school the next day so it doesn't it's really a disadvantage to teenagers or adolescents um, the schooling hours and I know some studies have done where they've actually delayed the school start times um, to see some favorable outcomes. So uh, we teenagers are, are pretty much at a disadvantage in terms of their, their school schedules and, and their sleeping schedules. Yeah, it's incredible because I guess once we combine that evening chronotype with, you know, of course, a lot of our young athletes at Canada Basketball, it's the staying up, uh, Instagram, social media, Twitter, into the, into the wee hours. Can you unpack um, and review for folks a little bit of what's going on in terms of the physiology there with the uh, um, with the blue light and the impacts on, on sleep quality? Yeah, so depending on, on the age of the athlete, but typically a lot of athletes these days are using their electronic devices either before bed, in bed, after the lights have been switched off. And, and there's a few main problems with, with that. Firstly, the blue light actually re- restricts that melatonin from secreting, so it can, it can, it can actually restrict our, our sleep hormone from producing, which then delays how sleepy we feel so what happens is that it pushes that kind of sleepiness back to you know early hours of the, of the morning or depending on what time that attempt to go to sleep so there's that's one physiological reason and the other is is more got to do with the, the psychological aspects of of engaging on social media and and um it's an interactive uh, forum which basically it's like a feedback loop, so it's never ending. There's no end times on social media. You can scroll through Facebook, you can get bored, you can be on a chat with your friends, then you can flip to Instagram, then you'll flip to Snapchat, and it's a never ending cycle. Whereas in contrast to maybe watching a movie, then you know the movie ends and, and it's 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 finished. Um, I'm not saying watch a movie before bed, but there's a big difference between maybe watching a movie and and engaging on your on your cell phone or electronic device before going to bed. So there's definitely a physiological aspect there, and there's also a psychological aspect. 
And also, Facebook is it can stimulate uh, the mind and and the athlete. And if it's an elite athlete reading feedback on a, on a performance or or um, fans that are you know tagging them on Twitter and things like that, it can be quite detrimental both to their psychological well being and also their subsequent sleep. Yeah, I mean that's uh, very well said. And you know, for coaches and practitioners, trainers listening in. You know, would you suggest sort of a cutoff time for the phones or coaches getting the players to hand in the phones at a certain time? Or what are some of the solutions yeah. that you like to yeah, throw in there? Yeah, this is a discussion we have frequently with it's coaches a tough one, right? and, and managerial staff because on one end you, you remove the phone and when you remove the phone you might actually induce a state of, of anxiety and stress. And, um, and when you're in a state of stress or an anxiety before going to bed, that, that's, not, that's not a good thing either. Um, and a lot of athletes use their mobile phones for um, their alarms the next morning. So not having that alarm or that reliable alarm can also induce some sort of uneasiness or sort of anxiousness. So um, I would definitely recommend potentially not removing the phones from the athletes because that in itself may cause some issues. And, and it's an individual thing. Athletes are individual. Everyone's different. Um, but I would probably suggest not removing the phone, but ask them to, to not use them within an hour, uh, of, of attempting to go to sleep. So a good strategy is putting alarm on for when you're an hour before your bedtime will be. And, and that will be your, your perfect wind down kind of routine to establish. And that would be involved removing, removing the phone. And it may be difficult initially. Um, but over time, if the athlete learns and if the athlete wants to be professional and, and reach the levels that they, they strive for, then potentially that's the way the coach or the managerial staff will need to go about, about you know, um, recommending not using their phones within an hour before going to bed or attempting to go to sleep. Yeah, it's amazing once you set up that environment where players get used to the fact that they have to power down or hand in their phone or whatever it might be that once that sort of environment set up, then, then athletes kind of fall into fall into place. But um, otherwise, yeah, it can definitely be a tricky uh, tricky scenario to, to navigate. As you mentioned, you know, taking it away can induce some anxiety. Yeah, um, definitely. Now, what about coaches, though? We always talk about athletes and sleep. All the focus is there. Um, coaches, obviously, notoriously up up late, uh, looking at game tape up early. Um, how is sleep or lack of sleep impacting coaches and decision-making? Well, definitely, um, that's something that uh, I felt was quite neglected within within the sleep research, and um, so we we actually got some data on some coaches and had a look at them compared to actually how their sleep was, uh, how their team was sleeping, and to no surprise, like you mentioned, the coaches are staying up late watching video. They're trying to make team selections, so they're actually instead of uh, going to sleep and going to sleep easily, what they're doing is they're thinking about uh, what team they need to pick for the next day, what the opposition's going to do. So they've got a number of different thoughts going through their head while they're attempting to go to sleep. So um, it'll take them longer to fall asleep and, and they've got a lot on their mind. So um, it can definitely disrupt their sleep. And, and what we know from the, from the existing sleep research is that uh, when – we don't get enough sleep. We're not in a good psychological state. We make poor decisions. Our error error rates increase, and um, and it's no different from coaches trying to make good decisions, even during a, during a game. Um, it, it, there is a chance that they could make the wrong decision, um, and and also you, you know your athletes are smart. They'll pick up on on whether or not a coach is is switched on that particular day as well. So um, it, the coach always needs to be on, whereas if an athlete is, is slightly off, yes, depending on what sport it is, it can be identified, but um, the coach always needs to be switched on. And it's quite it's quite surprising that this, this amount of research has not really been the focus. Absolutely. And, I mean, especially in light of a lot of, uh, in the NBA anyway, there's been – some coaches in terms of uh, health concerns and um, you know, the focus shifted just to the, the strain and stress that the lack of sleep does put on um, coaches. And you've also um, 
looked into another area, which is actually the referees, the officials, which is again sort of a third uh, lens with yeah. which we don't often view this. And so, what about <laughs> what about referees and umpires? You know, we have the World Cup right now. So we decision actually, making. Yeah, so we actually. We, <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, the referees and umpires are probably the most important people in our in our games, and and some of their decisions, depending on the sport, can actually uh, have a huge impact on the game. So their decision making needs to be extremely precise, and sometimes they need to make that decision within one tenth of a second. And um, so we've started to embark on this this research, looking at how uh, referees sleep and and their perceptions of their performance. And we've actually just launched a survey here in Australia um, examining that that particular question. So that's kind of a, a phase one where we're just asking referees how much they sleep and whether or not when they sleep poorly before a competition and whether or not they think when they sleep poorly, do they actually perform poorly and make poor decisions on, 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 on the day of their game. So... Um, the next step would definitely be looking at some more objective measures, um, such as actigraphy or even polysonography, if we can. Um, so, yeah, so that's something we're starting to embark on now because, like coaches, referees, are, uh, they are also neglected compared to our athletes, especially the amount of money that's poured into athletes compared to referees. 100%. And, uh you know, so if we have coaches or referees, obviously, and athletes not getting enough sleep, um, you know, in terms of napping, is that a strategy that they can help to augment sleep quantity, sleep quality? And how do athletes uh, estimate their sleep quantity when they do take naps? Is that is it accurate? Are they engaging in this uh, enough? Yeah, so napping is a, is, is a hot topic. Um, how much do you nap? Uh, what times do you nap? And things like that. So typically the best time to take a nap is between two and four in the afternoon where we have a what we call a post-lunch dip. So the, we recently did a study looking at um, asking athletes how much they felt like they slept while they were wired up to um, the polysonography. So this is the gold standard in sleep monitoring so we can actually determine how much sleep they had. So we gave 12 uh, soccer players two nap opportunities so we gave them a 60 minute nap opportunity and a 120 minute nap opportunity so one hour and two hours and we asked them at the conclusion of, of the nap how long do you feel like you slept for and typically the the athletes underestimated how much they slept by 10 minutes each hour so they would if they slept for 50 minutes they were saying oh, i slept only 40 so was quite interesting uh, finding, but the the main problem with that study is that it's only done over over a nap opportunity, so we don't necessarily know over a full night period or a main sleep opportunity how much they whether or not they underestimate or overestimate um, how much sleep they they've had. So it's it's definitely something to be a little bit cautious of when interpreting. But for this particular study, they underestimated by ten minutes per hour. And is there a, a number? I mean, I was talking with Dr. Amy Bender last year on the podcast in terms of you know napping, lengths of naps, and I know that's another hot topic of you know how long yeah. should athletes nap for? Is there a is yeah. it obviously highly individual, but are there some general heuristics it's, you could? Uh... Yeah, it's 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 highly individual, but it's also dependent on who you ask um, and and what day it is. Is it is it a competition day? Is it is it a rest day? Is it um, a training day? So the the main the main questions is we always advise less than an hour. Um, this is basically just to reduce that sleep inertia, that you you know that grogginess feeling um, you get once you once you wake up. And then some other sleep researchers recommend 90 minutes when it's a non-competition day. So that's basically so you can go through a full sleep cycle. The only problem with the with the napping is that if you do it too late in the afternoon, then potentially you can disrupt. Um, and your sleep that night so that kind of sleep propensity or that sleep pressure that you kind of accumulate during the day um, is is reduced by having that nap so um, depending on the athlete depending on the sport but typically um, you know a 20 minute nap is quite a good idea to reduce that daytime sleepiness so maybe giving yourself 30 minute opportunity 10 minute to fall asleep and have that 20 minute nap 
um, on a competition or, or training day, I would advise, and that way it doesn't actually disrupt your your sleep the fol- that that particular night. Terrific. Yeah, I was going to <clears throat> mention there the you know the sleep opportunity being just as you mentioned that kind of setting the timer for sixty minutes and allowing yourself that uh, you know five or ten minutes to fall asleep and. Then I guess the nap would be 50 minutes or 20 minutes, as you suggested there. So, so folks kind of have a handle on uh, on how to kind of set that. Um, in the NBA, obviously, there's the, the famous for the NBA naps, which can often go uh, much longer than an hour and a half, two, three hours sometimes. W- what are some potential pitfalls there of, of napping too long? I mean, you sort of touched on, obviously, the sleep inertia yeah. and, 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 and interrupting the late night sleep. Are there other aspects to performance that could be impacted there? Well, definitely, um when you look at um, some of the research done um, on sleep inertia where you wake somebody up after you know an hour nap and you ask them to perform, they definitely do not perform at the level, at a cognitive level at least, um, as compared to when they, when they haven't napped. So um, there's been some conflicting evidence in terms of, of sports performance and whether the nap actually has an impact um the only good thing about um athletes for example is that typically you're not waking up and then performing straight away so that's that's probably a positive you're not waking up from a nap and then um going down and and having to bust out a hundred meter sprint um well if you are then you shouldn't be is what yeah, you've, de- you've definitely slept in too long <laughs> if that's the case right <laughs> Um, so that's, that's, that's a great, so giving yourself that, that, you know, 30 minutes or to an hour period of where you can actually, um, wake up and, and remove that, that grogginess feeling. Obviously the longer you nap, the, the more likely you will experience that sleep inertia and that grogginess feeling. And then it will definitely disrupt your, your, your sleep um, that subsequent night. So obviously not too late in the afternoon is really important. Absolutely. I mean, I've found the, the 30 minute sleep opportunity to be really helpful for myself. And I think a lot of athletes and even clients almost struggle with the concept of having this shorter nap because they might not feel like they're actually falling asleep or they might feel like it's too short a time period. Could you go through maybe some of the physiology of what's happening even if they're taking this uh, short sleep opportunity? Well, the, it's interesting because this the, the, the 20 minute power nap actually derived from on call workers such as doctors or paramedics that that would have to wake up and perform heart surgery um, within you know one minute of, of waking up. So that actually the the reason why that that 20 minute nap is is it, well they've given you a 20 minute nap opportunity is basically so that way you can wake up and perform um, heart surgery. So. Yeah, that's that's one one important thing to consider the difference in in the research and where it's come from or where the idea of the twenty minute nap has come from. And and for clients or athletes who say, you know, well, I'm not actually going to fall asleep. Like, what type of um, <clears throat> instructions or suggestions would you give them? Because oftentimes you're sort of just gently into that yeah. first phase. You're not really asleep, but you know, you yeah, do feel better afterwards. But a lot of athletes struggle with that concept of of not fully a falling lot of asleep. Do you struggle with that concept and? It's, it's so funny because it's not uncommon if you come into our sleep lab or, or even our office space where you'll see someone having a lie down on, on the couch or um, with a pillow or, or a, a paper over their face for 20 minutes. So it's quite a common, it's quite a common situation. It's quite accepted within a, a sleep lab, as you would expect. I was going to say, it's one um, of the few places that, that you can get away with that, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> which, is pretty, which is pretty funny, actually. Um, but in terms of clients struggling with the idea if they don't fall asleep, um, I think the the main point is not emphasizing having um, actually falling asleep. It's actually just having some time out from your day to, to recharge. Maybe you can engage in some mindfulness, uh, some relaxation, progressive relaxation techniques. So the emphasis is shifted on sleep because when there's so much pressure to sleep, it's kind of like choking in sport when there's so much pressure to perform quite often if we if we are over focused we will not perform so it's a similar situation when you put too much pressure on yourself to fall asleep fall asleep fall asleep um, it's you're definitely not going to be able to fall asleep so shifting the focus on having 20 minutes to sit down or lay down close your eyes 
engage in some progressive relaxation techniques and and kind of switch off from your day for that 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 20 minute period and and come back recharged and, and revitalized this is probably a better focus for somebody that wants to take you know time out of their day and for athletes things like you know music background music obviously now everyone's got their headphones on and warm ups you know is 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 some instrumental music maybe better than than music with lyrics if someone's going to take that 20 or 30 minute sleep opportunity or does it not matter um, I'm not actually familiar with the research. I don't even know if I think you've come up with a good research um, project, Mark. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's been much done on in, in terms of type of music and nap opportunity, um, but I think you've hit something quite interesting, and I think people would be willing to explore that. Um, if I were, I think it would depend on the individual. If they find – Hip hop music relaxing, then you know it might be okay. It it, it really does depend on the individual, and um, that's something we'd need to consider if you actually were to engage in that research, um, because the instrumental music might might not be relaxing for somebody compared to another individual. Absolutely, hundred um, percent. So, Doc, if we're thinking about athletes here, chronotypes, whether it's athletes, coaches, referees. Um, if someone is struggling with their schedule, how can they start to potentially shift their chronotype or, or help to start to augment um, sleep quantity and quality to, to improve whether it's physical performance or mental performance? How can you start to shift your chronotype? So if you're someone, if you're an athlete and it's early morning practice and you're 19 years old and you're struggling to get up, um, what are some of the yeah. first places that you start with to say, yeah. hey, this is where we're well, going to first level? Well, that particular then... example, yeah, if you're a teenager, a 19-year-old teenager, and you're an evening type, but your your training session occurs in the next morning, then potentially I, I still would advise not going, not attempting to go to sleep before 10 p.m., as you'd find it very difficult. But what you could do is you could supplement your main sleep period with, with a nap, a nap opportunity or, or a daytime nap the next day um, and that's one way you'll be able to manage that kind of sleep deprivation that you'd ac- accumulate over over the course of the week it's definitely it's like sleep when when we I always use sleep must be part of the program and we also talk about sleep as a diet you know it takes it takes time to change sleep behavior it's some people just think oh yeah I'm gonna do one one thing and it's going to change overnight. It's quite, it's, it's like a, a behavioral change kind of situation where it takes time. So adjusting your, your bedtime by one hour from one day to the next is probably not going to be a good idea. It's about strategically breaking down what your behavior is and, and maybe making it earlier day by day or over the course of a few weeks. It's, it's something, it's just like everyone wants a, you know, a magic pill to, to lose weight. It's, it's not that easy. It's, it's something that requires, you know, a planned approach. And, um, if someone is struggling with their sleep schedules, I would definitely advise speaking to either, um, the the coach or someone involved at at the organization and and they can definitely it what I'm saying is basically it's it's difficult to determine unless you know the individual and the schedules but um, it doesn't happen overnight yeah absolutely I mean obviously changing habits is is is, is the major win if you can do it, but it's, it's difficult to do. And I think we've reached that tipping point with things like sleep where, you know, a lot of athletes and coaches will definitely give you the, the head nod and say, yeah, we know this is important, et cetera. But as you say, it's, it's tough to actually get them to follow through on these habits and really start to build them in. Um, so maybe you can share with us just some general maybe do's and don'ts, whether it's kind of the sleep wind down routine or, or morning routine to help people um, yeah, establish I these think- patterns. I think we've just, we've spoken about a fair few, let's say, sleep hygiene tips throughout this um, this interview. But establishing a regular bedtime and wake up wake up time is really really important, and that includes on weekends or for athletes um, on their rest days. It's really important to establish that regular that regular bed and wake up time. Again, like we mentioned, putting the electronic devices away. Um, I like to advise at least one hour before going to bed. I know a lot of people out there will struggle um, to do this. Maybe if you can compromise with a half an hour, I think it's definitely better than um, just using it right up until until you attempt to go to sleep. 
it's really important to create a, a wind down routine. I know you touched on it there, but you know, your wind down routine is basically sending your body and your brain messages that you're getting ready to prepare for, for bed. So dimming the lights, um, engaging in some light reading or mindfulness, like I mentioned, making sure your room is at a, at a cool temperature um 18 to 20 degrees is typically what uh, we advise i think i don't know what that is in fahrenheit mark it's uh, 65 or something like yeah, that 65 68 sure. yep yeah something like that um also investing in a, in a comfortable mattress and pillow um is really really important and and the beauty about that is that you can cater it to yourself as opposed to, well, actually, if you're married, then you have to compromise like me where um, I prefer a firmer mattress and my wife likes a soft mattress. So uh, <laughs> you might that. have to compromise. But uh, And that's a really good point so, because sometimes athletes will be in that situation where there's not the ideal scenario. And so now you've got to figure out strategies to sort of work around it. And it's, uh, you know, it, it matters in the end, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and it's 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 one of those things that uh, you always have to juggle and, and manage, like you like you mentioned. And athletes are obviously sleeping in all sorts of places, um, hotels. Um, they might be sleeping in in like villages, like the Olympic Village, where the beds are sometimes uh, athletes are you know two meters tall, and the bed is you know. <laughs> half their size so um i think i remember seeing an image of usain bolt in one of the one of the beds for rio which was quite uh, amusing where they it was just a, i think it was a bit of a joke but it was quite a lot taller than the beds that were providing there yeah he's only um, six so, foot, he's only six foot five as well we got yeah, seven yeah, footers so. on our side so it's a whole different animal um, <laughs> i can imagine i can imagine how do they sleep when you when you travel do they sleep on the diagonal or uh, typically, they have some, you know, special beds for the guys to, to, to compensate for that, um, and you know, it's, it's and otherwise, it's yeah, it's, it's a lot of the um, uh, side position to, to make sure you yeah. get in there. But um, Doc, <laughs> in, in your work with athletes, you know, what sports do you find that you work with or seen that really this, um, you know, the chronotype issue maybe is is really highlighted, or the or sleep is really um, an issue. Um, in terms of chronotype, I don't think it's too much of of an issue per se it's just whether or not it's about that self-selection um or you adapt over over time like you mentioned earlier um in terms of getting sleep or getting a, a decent amount of sleep so between seven to nine hours i think a lot of athletes actually struggle to get eight hours of sleep per night and what we found with one of our major studies that i think had over 100 100 well i think it's 124 athletes and from all different sports, and we found that individual sports such as swimming, cycling, triathlon, these types of sports, they get significantly less sleeper than sleep than team-based sports such as uh, football, uh, Australian football, so football, I mean soccer, sorry, um, Australian football, rugby. So the team-based sports get, I think they were getting 30 minutes more sleep than, than their individual sport counterparts. So, um, but... As time goes on, we are becoming more and more, or coaches are becoming more and more educated and aware of the importance of sleep. But I don't think we've seen too much change in the amount of sleep athletes are getting. So that's a little bit alarming in terms of um, the, the, the detriments that sleep can have or lack of sleep can have on our mood, our injury risk, overtraining risk, and even our performance, and not to mention our well-being. Hundred percent, very well put. And uh, McKelly, you know, where's the evolution of the research going in terms of whether it's chronotypes or sleep? Where do you see things going in the next five or ten years? I think a lot of the research now is, well, maybe the next two, three years is is looking at training load and and sleep and whether or not um, if we increase the tra the amount the, the the amount of training load an athlete partakes in, um, is this improving their sleep or do we are we kind of, let's say, yeah, the the more the training load increases, do we increase sleep a little bit and then the sleep plateaus? And then we have all sorts of um, issues in terms of um, overtraining, overreaching, burnout, you know, physical and mental exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the research is definitely heading in, in the injury risk kind of dimension, which kind of started out that way anyway. 
So I would expect to see a lot of papers being produced on, on training load and, and sleep and whether or not it causes or, or can mediate injury risk and, and performance plateau. And when we look at the role of technology in all this, um, you know, is there a, a space? Uh, where are we at in terms of technology being able to really highlight, you know, is, is, are these measures validated, these devices validated to yeah. really tell us what's going these, on with sleep? Are they, can, yeah, they, these, can they cause these... anxiety in themselves, you know, because you're, <laughs> you're assessing your sleep constantly? Where, where, where is that middle ground? Yeah, I think there is definitely a middle ground there. And then the, the amount of devices that can tell you that you're in deep sleep, which they actually cannot tell you that you're in deep sleep. So if you have a device that's, that's attached to your arm or using your phone, an app on your phone, and it tells you you had 3.5 hours of deep sleep or slow wave sleep, um, I would not be inclined to believe it. Um, these devices are purely based on an algorithm that's, um, it's based on the general adult population and it's, it's, there's no way they can tell what, how long you spent um, in, in different stages of sleep. All they can tell you is potentially how much movement there was or lack of movement there was when you were asleep. So it's really important just to be cautious when using um, these, these kind of devices. They are good at tracking over time if you want to see if there are any changes in your life and, and seeing whether or not you're increasing the amount of movement or um, the, the amount of sleep you're obtaining or if it's, if it's moving in a, good, in a positive or negative direction. That's, that's probably one, one logical use for it. But in terms of determining how much um, slow wave sleep or deep sleep you obtain, I, wouldn't, um, I would advise not not actually relying on those 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 um, devices. If you are really concerned, I would definitely recommend um, having a sleep study done, um, and they're available, I believe, in, in most cities and, and countries. Um, so, yeah, it's say, really important just to be cautious. That sort of dovetails into my next question, which was, you know, this idea of if a client or athlete is doing this on their own, this, uh, you know, the over-interpretation of the information that they're getting and then the importance of, Obviously, really important to be working with a practitioner um, or, or expert such as yourself to be able to navigate all of the noise in the data, correct? Yeah, definitely. And um, it can work both ways. I can be an athlete and wake up and my – my I'm, I'm going to call it watch because I don't want to say any other specific types. <laughs> no but worries. If my watch tells me I slept you know, 9.5 hours of sleep, then – my perception that that's a positive thing is going to put me in a positive frame of mind for that day. So the actual physiological effect of not getting that amount of sleep is overpowered by my psychological state. Whereas it can have the inverse effect where it says, it might say 6.5 hours of sleep and I'm going to be like, Oh damn, now I'm tired because I slept 6.5 hours. So the psyche is an extremely powerful powerful thing when it comes to perception and, and sleep and, and our mood and, and our energy that we give off. Yeah, I imagine such a big confounder in a lot of the research is that, yeah, that the, the perception, how an athlete feels and all of this stuff is just plays such a huge role, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great stuff, McKelly. Well, listen, um, I'm sure everyone now is really curious uh, as we round things out here. I want to respect your time as to your uh, wind down routine or morning routine to establish this good uh, daily rhythm. So can you share with us uh, a bit of your um, routine? Yeah. I mean, typically not during the world cup, I might say that, um, <laughs> I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a good sleep hygiene during the world cup. Most of the games on are, uh, the first game now for, from the round of 16 is on at 1130 at night. So um, I will definitely be watching those games, but typically I like to have a warm shower Um before I go to bed, I will definitely dim the lights down, um, set my alarm after I've gotten out of the shower, and, and, and that's, that's typically the way I like to, to wind down, um, dimming the lights, having a warm shower. And, um, and sometimes if, if my mind is, is really bothered or clogged up, I will, I will either write a worry list, so some of the things that I might need to do the next day and, and put that, write that list down and put it next to my bedside, or something recently that I've been getting into is a little bit about uh, expressing gratitude. So writing a few things down that, that I was grateful for um, that particular day, even if it's a really small thing like having a nice warm 
a cup of tea in the morning or seeing an old friend or seeing something funny and anything, anything like that. So really expressing gratitude is, is something that um, I like to engage and puts me in a positive frame of mind and a relaxed state before going to sleep. Awesome, Kelly. Listen, fantastic insights here today. Really appreciate you taking the time coming on. Uh, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic research? Um, you can find me on Google Scholar uh, at Michele Lastella. Um, I'm also on Twitter as SleepSci, so that's just sleep, and then it's P-S-Y-C. So by all means, you can stay engaged there. I always update some papers that I publish as they come through or any conference presentations um, that I do. So, yeah, definitely Twitter is one way and, and Google Scholar is, is probably the other also, you can find me at um, Central Queensland University uh, website as well. There's a staff page there. Fantastic. We'll definitely include those links as well as links 